If you're physically able, stand with me. We're going to read Job 1, uh, verses 20 to 22. Verses 20 to 22 of chapter 1. Then I'm going to pray for you, and I ask that you pray for me. And we're going to see what the Lord has for us this morning from his word. It's going to be an awesome time. If you got it, say, I got it. All right. This is the word of God. Then Job stood up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. He fell to the ground and worshiped, saying, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will leave this life. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Throughout all of this, Job did not sin or blame God for anything. Subject today, we want to talk about Satan suffering and sovereignty. Uh, Satan suffering and sovereignty. Join me in prayer. God, uh, if we are honest, uh, suffering is not a topic we like. It's even harder to go through it. But we do know it doesn't take for you to be alive longer than a minute to know that life is hard and that suffering is a part of life. So God, as we begin to walk through the text and for those that are members here, we see what you've been doing from our first John series to our beef series and now here, how when we feel overwhelmed, how can we remain faithful in trust? And so God, while we don't like the topic and we know it is inevitable and it's inescapable, God, we are grateful that you are with us while we go through. So God, I I pray now, God, just for an anointing that we would understand and have a theology of suffering, God. What does it mean to suffer well and to maintain our faith? How do we hold on when we feel like we can't? So God, I am not wise enough for the depths of your word, so I ask that you would set me aside, move me out the way, use me as a willing vessel for such a time as this. Let your people hear what they need to hear. Build, 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 strengthen, deliver, heal, set free, God. I pray for just an atmosphere of vulnerability, Lord. As I don't know the depths or degrees of suffering in this room right now, but you do from marital issues to physical issues to the loss of loved ones. God, life is hard, but you are greater than our hardest moments. And those hardest moments do not define us, you do. So God, help us to believe that when we don't feel like it. So set me aside, use me as your vessel right now. In Jesus' name, we pray that all of God's people say amen. Amen, you may be seated. I want to start with a quote by Philip Yancey. He says this, faith means believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. Let me say that again. I want you to feel the weight of that because that's a poignant quote. Faith is, faith means believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. And I want you to hold on to that. I want that to be more than a quote of today, quote of the day. I want that to be a quote for life as we dive into this topic. Now, In my journey through life, I've had the honor by God's grace of graduating from both uh, my HBCU on the undergrad level and my seminary on the graduate level. And I've had many professors, and some of those professors are memorable. But if we're honest, when we are done with school, typically we are done with that professor. Amen. We, we move on, we got the degree, we got our paper, and we're ready to apply. And hopefully this paper will put a couple more commas on that salary. Amen? Uh, and as, as much as uh, I do love school and I love learning and there have been professors that have been impactful, there's one professor, and this is going to sound hard coming from a pastor who's a Christian, but I'm going to say it anyway. There's one professor I hate. And, and I know that's a strong word coming from a pastor. And you don't want to hear me say that, but I'm going to keep it a thousand with you. There is one professor I hate. And the reason I hate this professor is because I can't graduate from him. I can't get away from this particular professor. And another thing I hate about this professor is this professor loves giving pop quizzes. The quizzes that this professor gives, you don't feel prepared for. They come out of, it, out of the blue. And they, they challenge me in my health, and they challenge me in my marriage, and they challenge me in my faith, and they challenge me spiritually, emotionally, mentally. And that professor I'm talking about is Professor Payne. Professor Payne is the professor of life, and you can't get away from him. 
and he loves pop quizzes. You are not prepared, at least it doesn't feel like it, when that tragedy happens. You're not prepared when that suffering comes out of nowhere and you thought things were okay, then all of a sudden, Professor Payne pops up again. Does anybody hear what I'm saying? Professor Payne, he, he pops up. And, but what, this is what I've learned, and here's a good thing. It does not change how I feel about the suffering that I must endure. It does not change how I feel while I'm in the midst of it and going through, which is why that quote is so poignant. I have to believe in advance what won't make sense. It makes sense in reverse. I don't understand it sometimes until I'm out of it. At least I think I'm out of it. But here's what I've learned, that even though he loves pop quizzes, he loves throwing things in and on us, what I've learned is that if you're a Christian, all of his quizzes are an open book test. And what I've learned about Professor Payne and the suffering that we endure is that the suffering that we endure actually deepens our faith if we understand it, and it reveals something about life. And no one understands that more than a guy by the name of Job. Now, Job is outlined in about five sections. First, there's Satan's assumption. That's chapters 1 verses, and chapters 2, verse 10. There's this conversation with his friends, chapter 2, all the way to chapter 31. This guy by the name of Elihu comes out of nowhere in chapter 32 when he talks to chapter 37. God's response, because God seems silent. We hear him in the beginning in chapters 1 and 2, but it almost seems like he doesn't come up again until chapter 38 to chapter 41. Then there's Job's restoration that we see in chapter 42. Now, Job is most likely a nickname because it means hated, It means pain, and it means hostile. And this is most likely a nickname given to him by his three friends. Now, the book of Job is broken up into categories, but it represents a particular structure of the Bible. So there's what's called in the Bible lower wisdom in the wisdom literature books. Lower wisdom is what we would find in Proverbs. But then there's a category, a second category called higher wisdom. Say higher wisdom. And what higher wisdom, those books actually deal with the ultimate issues of life. And so Job and Ecclesiastes would fall into that category. Now, here's something interesting about Job is it was written before the books that Moses wrote, which are the first five books of the Bible. Now, I'm not saying that Job existed before Adam and Eve, but the reason the sequence is pivotal is because this is higher wisdom teaching us about a subject we don't like, teaching us and giving us wisdom about a subject we would rather skip over, teaching us about a subject we would rather circumvent, and that subject is suffering. It gives us some higher wisdom on how we can develop, listen, a theology of suffering and how, even though this doesn't sound like these two words go together, but how we can suffer well. It helps us to understand how we can suffer well. And it's important because there's some questions about the historicity of the book of Job. Now, people think it's only allegorical because it seems so out of the character of God to nominate someone for suffering. Doesn't seem like it flows. In fact, it messes with us. Some of us won't even read it. Because I feel like if I read it, something's going to (laughs) happen. But Job 1 begins with a historical statement. Ezekiel mentions Job, and so does the book of James. So the reason this messes with us is because God allows a good man to suffer. But what this is dealing with is, do we trust God in the midst of pain that seems and feels purposeless? Now, Job is vindicated in chapter 42, but here's, here's where if you've, you've been, especially if you've been in some old school churches, you heard that when they preach this, they say, God gave Job double for his trouble. And and that's true. He did give him double for his trouble, but it's so important that that we don't have these little cliches and we miss the content of his life. Yes, he replaced 10 kids, but he lost 10 children. The point of this is not that he gave him double for his trouble, though he did restore him. The point is that Job maintained his faith when he was a part of a conversation that he did not give God permission to and that he still stayed faithful in the midst of his suffering. The point of this is how can I go through but still trust God? How can things be removed from my life and I still trust God? 
That's what this is teaching us of the theology of suffering. Because when we go through certain things, if we're honest, we ask God, how could you allow this? And you fill in the blank with what your this is. Some of you, the this is my marriage. The this is my child who no longer believes. The this is the doctor's report that I did not want. How could you allow this? So this book raises some questions, doesn't it? Personally, I have to ask, do I trust God? That's our first question, while I'm suffering. Second question, is my commitment to God based on favorable circumstances? Three, what do you do when you're doing right and wrong happens? Question four, can I maintain, hear me, can I maintain my relationship when God has not given me a reason for what I'm going through? Question five, can I question God while I suffer? And and a very important question, question six, can I accept that not all of my questions will be answered. Now, now here it is. Job, thank you, Brother Baron. Job, Job has 330 questions. Why? Because when we suffer, we say, God, I need some answers. So there are 330 questions in Job. Now, just to put this in perspective, there are 150 questions in Genesis. 160 questions in a 150-chapter book by the book of Psalms. And then if we go to the New Testament, there are 150 questions in Matthew. So those are our personal questions, but then we have some theological questions about Satan. The question is, how much power does he have? Suffering, two questions. Why does God allow it? Then the second question about suffering to God is, how can he use it? Then about his sovereignty. How do we distinguish between what God allows and what God affirms? See, suffering reveals the depth of our faith. Will you trust him when you don't feel like it? Now, now here's why many of us have a bad theology of suffering. And it's not completely your fault, but many pastors have stood behind pulpits all across America and they've given you an incomplete version of biblical suffering. Because they get up here and they tell you, he'll never leave you, nor he'll never leave you, nor. And so they say that, and that is in the Bible, Hebrews 13, 15. But here's the problem. We teach it in a way that he'll never leave nor forsake me means that I won't feel forsaken. We teach it in a way that we won't feel like we've been abandoned. We teach it in a way as if we feel like we won't have to go through some very hard things that make us question the very goodness of God. So here's the point. Wasn't it Jesus who said, my God, my God, why have you? And so he's showing us that it's not that forsaken means you're not going to go through because he didn't promise that we won't go through what he promised to be with you while you and I go through. He promised his presence, not that you can circumvent the situation. And so we got to have the right theology about suffering. Now, here's some reasons for suffering. There are five. Number one, it's just a result of a fallen world, y'all. To answer, why why does it happen? He he says that Genesis chapter 3, because we're in a fallen world that has sin in it and people have free will, things happen. The second reason we suffer, this doesn't apply to all of your suffering, but some of us are suffering because of our personal decisions. Some of our suffering is self-inflicted. But number three, some of us are suffering because of external influence. It's not our fault. Someone abused us. Someone molested us. Someone touched us. It was not your fault. And we have to suffer the thoughts and the flashbacks. We have to suffer being hard to be intimate with people we can trust because of someone we should never have trusted. But then number four, we suffer for some reason that's just unknown. And I know we hate that. And number five, we do suffer because of Satan. Satan. So the, the book of Job is clear that Satan is the culprit and the cause, but it also shows us that God allowed it. So here's the point. Listen, family. Job gained a faith that could never be shaken because he was shaken. Hear me. Hear me. The Lord... And we don't like it, let's be honest, and we don't feel it, and we, we wish we could get around it, but the Lord does redeem our suffering. 
I, I'm reminded of a song. Some of you are familiar with Marvin Sapp, Never Would Have Made It. Yeah, yeah, I, and I'm stronger and I'm wiser, but he lost his wife and he lost other, other relatives when he wrote that song. In other words, the, the point is the reason that Job gained a faith that could not be shaken is because his faith was rocked to the core. And when you and I learn how to be faithful when we don't feel like it, how to be faithful when I'm not sure if I feel his presence, when I feel, when I be, can I be faithful when I feel like the hand of God is against me? When I go through that, the Philip Yancey quotes comes in, faith is believing in advance would only make sense in reverse. It will make sense, but what you got to do is you got to see the end of your movie. You got to see the end and remain faithful through it. And here's what I've learned, family. As much as we want to know why, knowing why we're going through what we're going through does not change what we're going through. And just, just if we can trust the omniscience of God, if we can trust the omniscience of God, what if God knows that if he told you why, it would just spark more questions. So he says, I'm not going to tell you why, because if I told you why, you'll question my goodness even more. So I'm withholding the why, but you need to know the what. The what is, I'm with you. The what is, I'm still with you. Why you go through? So here's our thought tattoo. Suffering reveals the depth of our devotion to God, and it deepens our understanding of God. Listen, suffering's only going to do two things. Either it's going to drive you away from God and to you deconstructing your faith. The biblical word is apostasy. Either you're going to say, if he's going to let, I don't want to serve a God that allowed that to happen to me. It'll, it'll drive you away. Or it's going to draw you closer to a deeper devotion when you realize that he's with you and he suffered because of you, but he still suffered for you. Either it's going to drive or it's going to draw, but you decide. How we respond to what we're going through. What this reveals is something known as the retribution principle of theology, which is a wrong theology about suffering. It essentially states that every act receives just punishment or reward in this present life. So we should be able to tell who is righteous or who is wicked, whether, whether by they, uh, they are visibly blessed or cursed on earth. And see, that's bad theology. Because Jesus was perfect and he suffered. And here's a righteous man who's going to suffer. Another example of this is John chapter 9, verse 2 and 3. It says this. This is about this blind man. He was blind at birth, and here's what happened. Here's this retribution theology. His disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And here's Jesus' response. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This came about so that God's mighty works may be displayed in him. Listen, all of your suffering is not punitive. Your suffering is not purposeless. God is not against you. All of your suffering is not tied to some secret sin. Sometimes we just suffer because God is sanctifying us through it. So chapter 1, verse 1, there was a man in the country of Uz named Job. He was a man of complete integrity who feared God and turned from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. His estate included 7,000 sheep and goats and 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large number of servants. Job was the greatest man among all the people of the east. His sons used to take turns having banquets at their homes. They would send an invitation to their three sisters to eat and drink with them. Whenever a round of banqueting was over, Job would send for his children and purify them. Rising early in the morning to offer burnt offerings for all of them, for Job thought, perhaps my children have sinned, having cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular practice. Here's our first point. When suffering, don't mistake what God allows with what God affirms. Okay. God allows things. Now, here's this profile, right? Job is from this land of Uz, a term probably uh, located somewhere in Edom. And so his profile is this. He has integrity, chapter 1, verse 1. He feared God, chapter 1, verse 1. He resisted evil, chapter 1, verse 1. He had a large family, chapter 1, verse 2. He was wealthy, chapter 1, verse 3. And he prayed over his children. Man, I want you to hear this. He was the priest of his home. The greatest thing we can give our families is a legacy of a, of a faith rooted in Christ as our foundation as men. 
And here it is, this man leaves this beautiful legacy. He's living his life, and yet he is the one who suffers. Now, let's be honest. This does not sound like the profile of someone that's going to go through. But here's the point. What's interesting about this book, this 42-chapter book, is chapter 1, verse 5, reveals Job praying for his children. Then in chapter 42, verse 8, Job is praying for his friends. So throughout his suffering, Job maintained a strong prayer life. Now, here's what we need to remember about suffering. Christ suffered. 1 Peter 2, 1, 24. Number two, Christ promised suffering. He said, in this world, you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world, John 16, 33. Righteous people suffer, 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. All of those who choose to live a godly lifestyle must, not if, not maybe must, endure persecution. Righteous people go through. Who's our example? The sinless, perfect, righteous Jesus who suffered. Number four, we don't like this, but this, this is still actually good news. Suffering is sanctifying. 1 Peter 2, 20 through 24 And then suffering, here's some more good news, even though we got to wait for it. Suffering has an expiration date. Revelation 21, verse 4. Now, here it is, Satan's Satan's assumption. Verse 6, one day the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan was with them. The Lord asked Satan, where have you come from? And he says, from Roman through the earth, Satan answered, and walking around on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Hold up, God. Why are you nominating folk? <laughs> Won't you nominate one of them shady judges? No one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect, perfect integrity who fears God and turns from evil. Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Remember, Job always, I mean, Satan always asks questions. That's what he did to Eve. Haven't you placed a hedge around him? That's where we get that idea of a hedge of protection. That's where we get that from. His household and everything he owns, have you blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and have creased in the, in the land? Verse 11, but stretch out your hand and strike everything he owns and he will surely curse you to your face. Very well. Really, God? The Lord told Satan, everything he owns is in your power. However, he, he gave permission and a prohibition. However, do not lay a hand on Job himself. So Satan left the Lord's presence. Here's our next point. God uses suffering for sanctification, transformation, revelation, restoration, and preservation. Now, the text shifts from from the angelic world to, to earth. And now it says that Satan was among the sons of God. Now, let me help you. It does not mean sons of God in the salvific sense in which we are sons and daughters of God through salvation. It means angelic beings is a term that, fo- that applies to both demons and angels. So it's saying that these are spiritual beings and they have this conversation. And God says, uh, what you been up to? He knows, but he poses this question, what have you been up to? And then Satan answers what echoes 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. It says, be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a lion, a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. So this story is unfolding. Let's be be honest. Uh, Jesus, or God, nominates Job. And my my wife and I went to a show with Kev on stage, the comedian, and he brought up this passage. And he said, man, Job went through all of this because of a bet between Satan and God. And I know we don't go to comedians for theology, but the truth is many of us feel that way, that this is some type of cosmic bet to where Satan throws some bait and God took the bait. But that's not what's happening here. What we have to understand here is God is omniscient and Satan is not. If Satan was omniscient, he would have tested someone else. This is why C.S. Lewis, when presented with the question, why do the righteous suffer? His response is, why shouldn't they? They're the only ones who can handle it. What is he saying? Righteous people understand that our righteousness doesn't come from us. (laughs) I'm only righteous because of God. And because I'm righteous because of God, his power rests on me. And so I can handle this suffering because he's going to do the heavy lifting even though I go through it. That's what he understands here. And so God knows the character of Job. There's a New Testament version of this where Jesus tells Peter, Satan desires to sift you like wheat. I tell you all the time, I wish the next verse would have said, and I blocked them. (laughs) But it doesn't say that. 
Jesus says, I have prayed for you. What is he saying? You have to go through the sifting, but I am with you while the sifting takes place. And family, that has to be enough for us. Because Satan's theory is that the only reason he loves you is because you blessed him. That's why he says, verse 9, does he fear you for nothing? In other words, he's only honoring you because he has stuff. He's only honoring. I mean, he got thousands of camels and sheep and cattle. He got 10 kids. He, he got servants. He has everything. But if you take that, I bet you he'll turn on you. But here's the question we have to ask. Do I want the presence of from God more than I want the presence of God? Do I want presence from or do I want the presence of? Can I tell you, let me help you out, let you pass this test. The presence of means more than the presence from because those presents will fade, but he won't. And that's what he wants us to see and he wants us to understand. And so it's showing the power of God. He gives permission with a prohibition. Satan still has to submit to God's authority. Now here's what what we need to understand about these 12 verses that we've gone through thus far, is Satan has a plan for your pain. The Savior has a purpose for your pain. Satan has a plan for your pain. The Savior has a purpose for your your pain. Satan's plan is that you will curse God. The Savior's plan is that you will call on God. Satan wants you to curse. God wants you to call. Satan wants you to deconstruct your faith. The Savior wants you to develop a deeper devotion in your faith while you go through. Satan wants you to separate yourself from community and from God himself. The Savior wants to sanctify you through what you're going through. Satan wants you to interpret this as God is rejecting me. God does not want me. God does not love me because if he loved me, he would not have me going through this. The Savior says, no, I'm actually redeeming your perspective because when you go through this, your faith is going to be stronger than you could ever imagine. Satan wants you to see your your pain as only punitive. It's a punishment. It's because of something you did 10 years ago. He wants you to process it incorrectly. The Savior wants you to see your pain as purposeful, as God is grooming and growing me. Satan wants you to see your pain as hopeless, through a lens of hopelessness. There's no hope for me. I'm going to be taken out by this. There's nothing good that can come from this. The Savior says, no, I want you to be hopeful that I will work through this. Satan wants you to be bitter, bitter at God, bitter at his people, bitter with the Bible, bitter with the spiritual realm in general. But God says, no, I'm going to make you better if you trust me. Satan's plan is for you to think that this is only evil and that God should be associated with the pain and that God is evil. God says, no, this is not, even though the enemy meant this for your evil, I'm going to quote Joseph, what God, the devil, meant for evil, God worked this out for my good. God is saying, I'm at work in and through and on you through this, even though you don't feel my presence, you can trust my character. But let me help you out. Here it is, family, because again, we get suffering wrong. It's not that we rejoice over what happened. I would never tell a woman to rejoice over losing that baby in her third trimester. We just will we'll rejoice because he did. No, 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 no. You, you got to get re- What are you actually rejoicing for and over when you go through? We don't rejoice over that child saying that they are deconstructing their faith. We don't rejoice over finding out that there's a mass when I go to the doctor. We don't rejoice over that. The point is of Romans 5. It says we rejoice in our afflictions. Then it tells you why. So it's not that I rejoice over the affliction. It's not that I rejoice over the situation. It says we know that if we go through this, that it's going to produce endurance, character, and hope. So I don't rejoice over what I'm going through. I rejoice over what God does through me while I go through. And so when I go through this, I'm going to gain some spiritual endurance that if I can go through that, I can go through this. I'm going to develop some hope. That even though it looks hopeless, I realize that God is still at work and I can be hope-filled. So I don't rejoice over the loss of that relative. I don't rejoice over that bad doctor's report. I rejoice that God is going to give me some spiritual endurance. He's going to build my character and he's going to renew my hope if I stay faithful. So I stay faithful in the midst of it. Now here's Job suffering. Verse 13, one day when Job's sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and reported, while the oxen were plowing and the, do- the do- donkeys were grazing nearby, the Sabians swooped down and took them away. 
And we hope that, hey, that, that's one bad message, but man, I'm, I'm, I'm sad about those donkeys, but we think we can make it. But it says they struck down the servants and the sword, and I alone have escaped. He was still speaking, but then there's another messenger. So here it is. It's piling up. God's fire fell from heaven. It burned the sheep and servants and devoured them. I alone escaped to tell you. Okay, that's two messages, uh, but, but I think I'll be okay. I'm going to go on and see what the end going to be. Verse 17, that messenger was still speaking mid-sentence. Yet another messenger reported the Chaldeans formed three bands and made a raid on the camels and took them away. They struck down the servants with the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Good God, can it get any worse? He was still speaking. Lord, I don't want another messenger to say nothing to me. He was still speaking, and another messenger came and reported, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine Their oldest bro- at their oldest brother's house. Suddenly, a powerful wind swept in, and the desert and struck the four corners of the house, it collapsed on the young people so that they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job stood up, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground and worshiped, saying, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will leave this life. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Throughout all this, Job did not sin or blame God for anything. Listen, God allows suffering but doesn't abandon us while we suffer. Listen, four things happen here. The Sabians, they took his oxen and his donkeys. God's fire, that's most likely is a way that they would describe lightning. And it burned up Job's sheep and his servants. The Chaldeans, they stole Job's camels. But then a strong wind killed 10 of his babies. And they were older because they were old enough to drink wine. But 10 of his children. Now, now, now Job, the richest man, and in a single moment, and isn't that how these pop quizzes from Professor Payne pop up? One moment. And here it is. He, these four messengers, and it gets worse and worse. And here's what we got to ask. What does Job have? He does have his grief. He's lost stuff, and more importantly, he lost his children. That brings us to the second thing Job had. Job has now 10 graves. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm still counting. Nine. Ten graves of children whom he watched take their first steps. Of children he most likely sat in his lap. Of children he watched grow up to where they're old enough to drink wine. So Job has his grief. Job has these graves. But don't miss this, because if you deconstruct, these are the only two G's you focus on. You focus on the grief and you focus on the grave. But there's a G that I want to encourage you. Job still has his God. God is still with him. God is still in the midst of this. God is still at work. And then I want you to see this. I want you to see his posture, though. His posture, he, he stood up. He tore his robe. He shaved his head. And these are all expressions of mourning. Now, this is Pastor Jerome. This is not the Bible, but I would imagine because the Scripture is letting us know that Satan is watching. Satan is watching because his theory is that if all this stuff is taken, that he's going to curse God to his faith. And so I imagine that that Satan watching Job hear these four messengers of losing his oxen, losing his sheep, losing his property, and losing his ten babies. That Satan is saying, we got another one. I can see him high-fiving the imps and the demons saying, we got another one. I told you those Christians are fake. And he sees them stand up. He says, yeah, Job is getting ready to say, curse God, curse God. He sees them stand up. But then when he stands up, he tears the robe. Satan is thinking, I got him. We got another one. High-fiving his demons. He shaves his head. Watch this, fellas. Watch what he say. Watch how quick he turns on God when God takes his stuff because he wants the presence from God more than he wants the presence of God. But then he thinks that he's going to curse God. But then Job flips the script and says, I still trust you. Job says he's going to worship. I still trust you. And family, when you are going through, you got to have a posture that says, I still trust you. I still trust you. My child is wavering in their faith, but I still trust you. The doctor gave a bad report, but I still trust you. My wife said she don't want me no more. I still trust you. Husband said he don't want me no more. I still trust you. Having massive layoffs on the job. I still trust you. I'm going through this and I don't want to. I still trust you. I don't feel like it, God. I still trust you. I'm still going to worship you. Though I'm feeling my pain, I'm still going to worship. I'm still going to praise you. I'm still going to honor you. I'm still going to lift you up. 
I'm going to stay on my knees. I'm going to worship you through my pain. Through my pain, I still going to worship you, Jesus. And you got to be able to say, though I'm in this pain, though I could turn my back on God, God, I'm still going to worship you even though I don't feel like it. So he says, I'm going to worship when I could walk away. But I'm going to press in. It could drive me away, but I'm going to let it draw me close. And he says, I'm going to worship. That's his posture. So he lays prostrate. He proclaims that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. He processes the sovereignty of God there. Then he prays him, hold up 10 graves, but he says, blessed be the name of the Lord. But then he proceeds to serve him. It says throughout all this, he did not curse God or sin against God. We see this. And notice what he says when he says God, he uses the personal masculine name Yahweh. Satan received permission, but Job didn't give permission, but he had to go through it anyway. Now chapters 1 verse 6, chapter 2 verses 1 through 6, 5, Satan pops up again with these angelic beings. But here's what happens in verse 6 of chapter 2. Very well, the Lord told Satan, because now Satan said, yeah. But if you let me touch his body, though, he's going to curse you. So Satan left the Lord's presence, verse 7 of chapter 2, and infected Job with terrible boils from the sole of his feet to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of pottery to scrape himself while he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. You speak as a foolish woman speaks, he told her. Should we accept only good from God and not adversity? Ooh, we. Throughout all this, Job did not sin in what he said. So here it is. If, if we recall, in chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, Job prayed that his children would not curse God. Hold on to that. Don't miss that. Job prayed that his children would not curse God. Job finds himself being tested to see that he won't curse God. God will often answer your prayer by testing you in the area you prayed about. The thing he prayed about his children, God said, I need you to eat that first. We saying, mm, but we don't want it. My wife has suffered from severe rheumatoid arthritis since the birth of our son. And so we had a beautiful thing to rejoice, but then also something to mourn at the same time. So jo jo Jordan's getting ready to be 13. So for 12 years now, getting ready to be 13, she suffers, and she has it in every joint. Even inflammation hits her eyes sometimes. It's, a, it's considered an autoimmune disease that she's lived with for 12 years. One, one of my prayers has been, Lord, is I, I want to have more empathy for my wife while she has this. And we've had conversation, and I'm not a perfect husband, and I need to show more empathy. And so that was my prayer. And so not to be too graphic, but last year, I'm, I'm at that age, brother, just turned 45 and had my colonoscopy last year. And I got a semi-good report. Then I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. Thank God, not nothing terminal in terms of cancer. But less than a year later, to start this year, this has been the roughest year for, for your pastor in terms of his health. So I had to have another procedure, 10 months of having a colonoscopy. I had to have another one to make sure there's nothing cancerous in my GI tract because I've had some severe issues. In the midst of that, I developed been having this crazy headache, but it's only been on the left side of my head. And while I had that, I ended up, I have an eye floater, which I still have in my left eye. It's a little black thing that just pokes around. I had to get my brain checked to make sure it wasn't nothing serious. Then I had to have a CT scan. And I'm telling you, the hardest thing was waiting for those results. And, and just, just, just let me pause. They sent me the daggone results before the doctor. 
I don't know what this word means. I'm giving myself a death sentence. I got Jalilila Blip Blip. What is Jalilila Blip Blip? So them apps, y'all need to change them apps. If any of y'all watch this, send it to the doctor first, not the patient. Now back to my story. I was scared. I'm making jests, but I, I felt, family, I wasn't sure that I was going to see 45 in my mind because I gave myself this. And so I'm, I'm, I'm going through all this and God reminded me and I'm like, I pray to have more empathy for my wife. And I have more empathy because I've now been through something. I wish he would have did it differently. Why couldn't you just supernaturally give me empathy? And I, I'm not anti-medication, so hear me. But I'm, I'm look, I'm, I, I got a functional doctor. Give me some food. Let, how can we handle this naturally, right? And so... I hate medication, but I had to be on medication. And here go my wife. She's been taking medication 12 years. And here she go, welcome to the club. <laughs> Y'all laughing, but I'm like. Because some stuff you got to go through and know that God is with you while you go through it. Amen. I, I, here's the point. Job cursed his birth, but he didn't curse his God. Seven things, and I'm just going to go through these because I'm short on time. I want us to have this time of prayer. I'm skipping a lot. We'll, we'll, we'll re-up next week. Can't get to all of it. Here's what we need to do while I'm suffering, okay, while I'm suffering. Listen, number one, allow yourself to grieve, but don't let your grief define you. He stood up, tore his robe, shaved his head. Those are expressions of grief and mourning. What does the text tell us? Mourn with those who mourn. God, it's not sinful for you to mourn and to be sad and frustrated. So allow yourself to grieve, but don't let that define you. Okay? Number two, continue to worship even when you don't feel like it. He lay prostrate. Ten graves, ten babies, gone, but he still worshiped. Number three, proclaim the sovereignty of God to yourself. It says God gives and God takes away. And I got to remind myself, God, you are still sovereign even though my wife wants a divorce, if that's your story. God, you are still sovereign even though my husband wants a divorce. God, you are still sovereign even though they see a mass. I got to remind myself because you don't feel like he's sovereign when you're suffering. Number four, process your pain with God by reading, reflecting, and reviewing. He is reciting, even though maybe the law, this was probably written before the law of Exodus 20. But here he is reciting the promises of God. Number five, praise God even when you don't feel like it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He blessed God. Number six, Continue to serve him and refuse to detach from community or deconstruct your faith. You're going to feel like leaving the faith sometimes, depending on the degree of your pain. Listen, you're not crazy for feeling that way, but you can't let your feelings lead you in that moment. Listen, you're not crazy for feeling like, man, I can't, tr can I trust? I feel it. Through all my health stuff, the church has been growing like crazy the first couple months, and it's been a, the most hellacious time in my health, and I'm in shape. God let this happen after I lost 34 pounds, eating right, eating clean. And it still happens. That's how I knew it was him. I didn't gave up fried. <laughs> Number seven, let others in. Chapter 2, 11 through 13, his, his three friends, I'm putting that in quotes. This is, this is the best time for them because it says that they sat with him because they saw that his suffering was severe. Let others in. I wish I could say that they were good, but for the most part, they give bad advice. Because from this point on, chapter, chapter 3 on, they essentially blame Job for his own suffering. Don't let it drive you away. 
let it draw you closer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, we honor you, and we praise you for your mercy, your goodness, and your kindness. God, let us say that even when we don't feel like you're kind. The question our culture is asking is not just if God's real, but is God good? And if we're honest, even though we're in the faith, sometimes we feel that same question when we hear that our child's been touched by a teacher or a relative. When we were abused and we did all we could to protect our child, then something happens to them and we look to the sky and we're frustrated. If I could be honest, we're PO'd. God, we feel like I'm doing all I can to serve you and you still let this happen. Let us be real because the people in the Bible are. So God, help us to be able to be uncensored with our venting, but still faithful in our volition, meaning our behavior still says, blessed be the name of the Lord, even when I don't feel blessed. So help us to process this. Prayer warriors, can you come forward? Guys, listen. Now is certainly the time to be vulnerable and allow people to pray over you. The altar was flooded first service, and some people came forward just saying, like, I just feel like it's too much. I feel like if it's not this, it's something else. And I'm, I'm just tired. And some of you feel that, and, that's, and that is okay. So as we open this altar... I want to pray right now for those that are going to be praying over people. Anoint them for this time, Jesus, and let them, give them the words to say as people come forward. Because I believe people are coming forward, and I know people need to come forward. So would you touch them? Let us all stand. So as they begin to sing and the altars open, come forward. Whatever it is, whatever the degree of your suffering is, whatever it is, even if it's your voicing frustrations with God, that's what we see in the imprecatory Psalms. You're not crazy for thinking that or feeling that, but don't let that stay there. And lastly, if you want to trust Christ and you want someone to pray with you, it's your faith in him that saves you. Would you come forward? So God, we thank you. You have been calling us to your altar as a church a lot lately and we receive it and we embrace it and we thank you for it in Jesus name amen the altar is open come forward family